distinguished panel. And uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mansager and Professor Jenks uh, on behalf of myself and the panel for the invitation to uh, be involved in this fantastic conference. The topic which our panel will address today is in many ways uh, a, f a synthesis of what we've uh, talked about over the last couple of days. And it's also a recognition that operations law practice has moved on significantly, I think, in the last decade, uh, in particular some of the challenges that we face. To think about it, 10 years ago, at a conference like this, we would have been talking about the effect of the CNN factor, uh, or the strategic corporal, or the 60 minutes test on the practice of operations law. And when we were doing that, we were really concerned with the more immediate effects of uh, reputation and the effect of immediate policy shifts on the conduct of operations. But today, I think we're facing up to the next generation of this uh, CNN effect, which is an operational fact of life. And that's really the greater public scrutiny and the alternative analytical critiques that are now being applied to very minute and discrete incidents in the operational sphere, and uh, operational conduct, and indeed uh, conduct on the battlefield. I think the first amongst these second generation consequences, certainly the first amongst them for a military lawyer's concern, uh, is the growing ubiquity of public debate uh, over our investigations of battlefield incidents. There are few nations represented here in this room today who have not uh, faced up to the very public dissection and deconstruction of one of their battlefield incident investigations. And just on this panel alone, uh, in Germany, we've had the Kunduz tanker incident very publicly discussed and dissected. Uh, the UK and the US have done detention and treatment issues out the yin-yang, uh, as is Canada, but Canada's not here on this, on this panel. Uh, Israel, as we heard yesterday, and, and we will hear more of this morning, has, has uh, very publicly been, uh, been dissected over the conduct of investigations. And even in Australia, the Director of Military Prosecutions is, as we speak, considering whether to uh, take forward an investigation into a special forces incident involving, in civili involving civilian casualties, uh, which took place uh, early last year in Afghanistan. So no operationally engaged country is immune from this trend. What factors play into this process? There are many, and the list is long. Some of them are the ubiquity of access to information, uh, but equally the ubiquity of access for comment to be uh, posted on the web and access to billions, uh, accessible to billions, uh, regardless, and that's the important point, I think, regardless of its factual accuracy uh, or of its analytical worth. Uh, and the moment something is posted, of course, it becomes something you have to respond to. Uh, also, uh, I think NGOs are much more professional uh, in their approach to these incidents today. They're much better equipped to actually conduct alternate investigations, as opposed to perhaps 10 years ago when the NGO response was often to uh, comment rather than to propose an alternative investigation, which seems backed up by uh, analysis. And also, I think ever more so, the language of public debate on operational incidents is now couched in legal terms. And there are very few media reports or, or NGO press releases that fail to link in some way to distinction or proportionality when we're talking about battlefield incidents. It's a very rare occasion where a legal term of art is not uh, pulled into the debate. And of course, the language of the law of armed conflict in particular uh, is very prone to be misused. And the reason that is, I think, is because when people deploy the language of the law of armed conflict, particularly terms of art, they seem to provide an aura of, uh, of uncontestability or of authority to what might otherwise be a fairly weak statement uh, or a fairly weak analysis. So investigating, enforcing in, modern operational, in the modern operational context, of course, is not just about investigating. Uh, it is equally, and perhaps even more so in some cases, important to deal with who investigates, when and how they investigate, uh, where they investigate, which body of law do they investigate under, uh, which body of law or which state's interpretation of the law do they apply the results against. So it's quite a complex uh, issue. So the plan for this panel is uh, I will introduce uh, each panellist and their discrete focus in a moment. Uh, each panellist will speak for uh, 20 minutes, no more than 20 minutes, and at 90 minutes I'll bring out Bruce, my trusty stick, and poke them. 
Uh, after the third speaker, we will take our coffee break, and I would uh, I would uh, request humbly that you limit that to uh, ten minutes, which will give us five minutes to uh, muster back in here because we are on a more time constrained panel this morning. Uh, we'll then have the fourth speaker, uh, and our aim is to leave a, se a session of, of 35 to 40 minutes for questions and discussion, uh, because. This panel, as I said at the outset, is very much a synthetical panel. It brings together a number of the issues we've talked about over the last, uh, the last few days. Uh, and now briefly to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Wolf, von, Wolf Heinzel von Heinig. And of course, Wolf will lay the foundations with respect to the rule set, which is really the fundamental issue. When you're talking about investigation enforcement, you've got to know the rule set. Uh, and he will then also give a short outline of the German perspective. Following that will be Commander Andrew Murdoch, who uh, is the, uh, the senior operations law, who runs the operations law desk for the Royal Navy. And Andrew will talk about uh, the U some UK experience with uh, investigation and enforcement, and this will follow on nicely from some of the issues that uh, Ashley Dix uh, raised yesterday. Then we'll have Dr Roy Schondorf, who is a senior lawyer in the Ministry of Justice for the Government of Israel, and he will talk about uh, investigation enforcement through the lens of uh, Israel's uh, investigation enforcement process, looking particularly at um, <coughs> uh, through the lens of the Goldston report, again a, a matter raised yesterday. And then finally, uh, Commander James Krasker, who is a, an eminent, uh, a, an eminent um, uh, teacher here at the, the Naval War College, will look at a particular recent issue where a number of these factors about uh, what's the rule set to apply, how's investigate, how's in is enforced, uh, come into play, and that is the, the recent uh, Israeli flotilla, uh, flotilla action. So with no further ado, I would invite uh, Wolf to take the floor. Well, thank you. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank uh, Dennis Mansaga and all the others for having invited me, and I would already now like to congratulate them for this very spe special conference and uh, the topic chosen. Uh, but before I start, I would like to file an official protest. Uh, I have been seated between an Australian and somebody from England. And as you all know, the World Championship in football, uh, you call it soccer, we bet them, we will beat them, and I'm here threatened <laughs> by a stick. Uh, <laughs> now, before I uh, will... Uh, talk a little bit about uh, Kunduz and, and uh, what we did uh, um, following uh, the attacks on the two tankers, I would indeed first of all like to talk a little bit about the legal framework, um, and that in the context of asymmetric warfare. Uh, to be quite clear, uh, the term asymmetric warfare has been abused uh, for many different purposes. And uh, already uh, during this uh, conference and in, uh, on other occasions, uh, you have uh, a panoply of different uh, meanings and different connotations what, with regard to asymmetric warfare. Some say, oh, it's non-state against state. Uh, some say it's the weak against the strong. Some say it's the technologically advanced against the less technologically advanced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if those people say, oh, this is something very new, then I am more than surprised, to say the least, because I have never seen in history any war that has been symmetric. So uh, there were always weaker parties, uh, there were always stronger parties, there were technologically advanced parties, and others. And uh, why should you complain if you start a dispute with somebody who is two square meters uh, and if you lose against him? You cannot complain about that. That's not unfair. And if you look at the law of armed conflict, the law of armed conflict has almost never in the past uh, paid attention to such asymmetries, alleged asymmetries or real asymm asymmetries. Um, this especially holds true with regard to technological asymmetries. Um, of course, there were always uh, um, endeavors uh, to um, try to, well, find or use the law in order to compensate for technological asymmetries. Look, for example, at the uh, futile endeavors of the United Kingdom to outlaw the submarine when they experienced that the submarine was jeopardizing their 
superiority in uh, surface uh, warfare. So, but those efforts were all in vain because the law of armed conflict never wants and never aims at compensating such asymmetries. And the same holds true with the view to the experience of the, especially the Second World War, with regard to asymmetries as regards actors. If you look at the Geneva Convention number three, if you look at uh, other rules of international law of armed conflict, you will see that uh, there are certain persons who are privileged and others are not. And uh, the fact that certain armed groups, organized armed groups, uh, enjoy a special status because they enjoy POW status under Article 4A of the Third Convention is nothing but a reaction, but o only to a certain extent a reaction to the practice of the Second World War. And all the ac other actors that uh, already in the past played a role during an international armed conflict are dealt with either, either under the uh, heading of direct participation, and we talked about that quite a lot, even though we disagree uh, in the details, so to speak, not in, uh, about the principle. So, in short, the law of armed conflict has taken care of many of those real or alleged asymmetries. And uh, if I use the term asymmetric warfare, I will use it in a different meaning. Uh, I will understand asymmetric warfare, and I have to quote that now literally, sorry about that, as applying to armed hostilities in which one actor or one party endeavors to compensate its military, economic, or other deficiencies by resorting to the use of methods or means of warfare that is not in accordance with the law of armed conflict. That's what asymmetric warfare is about today. And if you look at the law as it stands, well, some of those phenomena of asymmetric warfare or the deliberate violation of the law of armed conflict has been taken care of by the law. Some of those phenomena rather well, others less well. And that, of course, is something which uh, makes those operators who abide by the law uh, dissatisfied, so to speak, uh, because they are obliged to abide by the law and their respective enemy is not. And the consequences the law of armed conflict provides for such a violation of the law of armed conflict are not very helpful for the operators. Of course, everybody knows it is uh, uh, prohibited to resort to perfidy. Uh, it may even amount to a war crime, but this will not prevent the enemy of doing that. Uh, the enemy may uh, uh, decide to resort to suicide killings, which are not per se prohibited, but of course they are if they amount to perfidy. Is that helpful? Not very much. Uh, I must add, however, in this context, that uh, one need not necessarily only apply the law of armed conflict uh, with a view to such acts of asymmetric warfare. Uh, one example, in order to be quite clear. Of course, it would be prohibited to kill a civilian. Um, uh, but it's not only about uh, a civilian directly participating in hostilities that would make that civilian a targetable person. There's also always the right of self-defense of the respective individual soldier that we shouldn't leave out of consideration, which also plays a role and that is not being uh, ruled out in its applicability by the law of armed conflict. Um, if you look at other practices, uh, for example, the use of human shields, um, I think uh, we have discussed this issue quite often. I hate windows. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you buy an Apple computer? <laughs> it's an American product, isn't it? Now. Um, if you look at human shields, we have discussed that at length, but let me just recall what the law says. Uh, first of all, we have, of course, that distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shields. If you have a voluntary human, human shield, and very often you do know that they are voluntary, then they are directly participating in hostilities. Oh, come on. 
is that conference sponsored by Microsoft or? <laughs> um, if they are voluntary, they are directly participating in hostilities, they are targetable, and there is no capture or kill alternative, uh, to be quite clear on that. Uh, however, when it comes to involuntary human shields, uh, you as the law abid abiding party feel of, uh, are of course in a rather uncomfortable situation because you know that those human shields are involuntary and you are under an obligation to either minimize or to prevent excessive collateral damage. But I think the answer here has already been given by Joram Dienstein, uh, which is quite clear. Uh, the proportionality test is different when it comes to involuntary human shields. <coughs> that means that the casualties or the uh, amount of casualties that may result from an attack has to be established in the light of a modified principle of proportionality and not in the light of the principle of proportionality as we know it under Article 51, for example, of the Additional Protocol 1. Uh, of course, there is one thing which, which we shouldn't uh, leave out of consideration, and that is the notorious Article 44, parag uh, 44 Paragraph 3 of the Additional Protocol 1. And unfortunately, the law of armed conflict here has introduced uh, an element of a double standard, so to speak. Uh, by relaxing the conditions that combatants must fulfill if they want to continue to enjoy combatant immunity, etc. Of course, you will say Article 44.3 is not customary in character, and I cannot but agree. And of course, one can even add that Article 44.3 is designed more for a situation envisaged in Article 1.4, meaning those uh, internationalized armed conflicts in the exercise of the right of self-determination against the racist regime, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, and that, uh, however, and that unfortunately complicates the situation, Article 44.3 is very often relied upon by commentators who are not necessarily knowledgeable in the law of armed conflict, but who just read the article and say, oh, here's the answer. And that is one of our tasks, that we have to make them aware that they should learn the law better, and if they comment upon the law, that they should rather seek advice beforehand before they, before they give an opinion. But still, this is far from being helpful on an everyday, on the practical basis the commander finds himself or herself in. Because the consequences of the law of armed conflict provides for such violations of the law are not helpful for the respective commander in the field or soldier in the field. They only would help in the aftermath and uh, they would certainly not prevent the enemy from continuing to pursue his illegal tactics. So the question now is, um, what can we do? On the one hand, uh, the law of armed conflict is rather flexible and uh, can be adapted to this phenomenon of asymmetric warfare. But very often the law is either silent or not very helpful in order to um, re-establish a balance of or uh, in an equality of arms, so to speak, in armed conflict. The principle of reciprocity is not helpful at all. You cannot rely on a determined enemy who even wants to die or who wants deliberately to violate the law. So the principle of reciprocity plays, unfortunately, no role here. In view of that, there have been some doubts of whether the, this phenomenon of asymmetric warfare can at all be grasped by and measures, measured against the law of armed conflict as it stands today. And there have been continuous calls to reform the law, to adapt it to those new threats. Well, let me be quite clear. I am not very positive vis-a-vis -vis such claims because uh, the law of armed conflict as it stands today is the result of a development that lasted for more than 150 years. It is based on well-established principles. We are educating and training our armed forces in that law, and I don't think there is a necessity for any kind of reform. Uh, but of course, that does not solve the problem if I tell you we need to ha work with the law as it stands today. 
And of course, now the question arises, what can we do uh, in view of this growing privatization or others call it demilitarization of war that is the phenomenon today? Uh, well, if the situation, if the situation amounts to an armed conflict, and please keep that in mind, not every counterterrorism operation is necessarily an armed conflict triggering the right uh, the law of armed conflict. Not any military operation or operation involving the use of military forces triggers the applicability of the law of armed conflict. There have unfortunately been too many misunderstandings uh, with regard to that, uh, uh, culminating in the claim that even counter piracy operations are governed by the law of armed conflict, conflict which is simply wrong. Simply wrong. Um, but if the situation amounts to an armed conflict, we, of course, still stand there and are a little bit helpless. I have to admit that. Uh, but this helplessness, um, I think, also results from an over-cautious conduct by our respective political leaders and by our armed forces themselves. We have given uh, up uh, the um, uh, dominance, so to speak, over information. They are in the hand of others, non-state actors, call them NGOs, call them interest groups, or call them what you like. And, uh, and even journalists, uh, as you have uh, experienced just recently, uh, can contribute in the one or the other way uh, in jeopardizing the success of your respective mission. Now, all these problems could be easily coped with if we didn't fall into the trap of political correctness. To be quite clear, there is no necessity for any armed forces engaged in armed hostilities to invite NGOs, apart from, of course, privileged NGOs like the ICRC and others, but certainly not the four mothers of New York. Um, and. Uh, so here, uh, even though it may be politically incorrect, the law is quite clear. You are not under an obligation to accept non-state actors, NGOs, in the battlefield or near the battlefield. So why don't you make use of that possibility the law clearly opens for you? The other, however, is that it takes too long to react to reports or claims of alleged violations of the law of armed conflict. It simply takes too long. Uh, very often, those interest groups, whether they are pursuing a political agenda or not, are very fast. They publish their reports within a couple of days, very often, on the internet, and they claim that there have been violations of, uh, of the law of armed conflict, and then you are in the situation that you have to react, you are in the situation that you have de to defend yourself, and you know, he who defends himself accuses himself. Very simple. <laughs> so we have to do a better job in at least informing the public uh, not about every detail of an operation that might have gone wrong or not, but we must be as quick as possible to inform at least about the substance of the operation and of the e incident that took place. When it comes, however, to um, and the Germans in the Kunduz uh, attack experienced uh, what that means if you come too late. The newspapers for weeks were full of allegations of violations of the law of armed conflict by that poor German colonel uh, who was even cited uh, by General McChrystal um, in the presence of one specially invited journalist. Uh, and he was told that he d did it all wrong. Uh, I don't know how they knew it, but again. Uh, the problem is, uh, however, that uh, the Germans took so long that now, even though the uh, Office of the Federal Prosecutor has delivered the final report, which uh, uh, led to the result that there will be no indictment of the German colonel, nobody's interested any longer. And the general uh, uh, public opinion is that was a violation of the law. Still, they are speaking of 142 people either killed or wounded. Other figures say they are less than 100. 
Are they all civilians? Certainly not. Many of them, 50% or even more, were Taliban fighters. But nobody cares about that any longer, that the Taliban fighters were, of course, lawful targets. It's not about the trucks only. It's also about <coughs> the Taliban fighters, and some of those were rather senior. Of course, they were targetable. But this all doesn't matter any longer, because the general perception is that of an, the illegality of the attack conducted. And we have to do a much better job in that. Now, when it comes to enforcement, and I'm finishing with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm German, you know. <laughs> uh, when it comes to enforcement, we are at a loss. Because uh, what can we do against a determined enemy? They want to die. They don't care about criminal law proceedings, either domestic or international. So even those who think that the ICC is a good idea, uh, well, they, I think, overestimate the strength and the power of criminal law and criminal proceedings, because that will certainly not deter a determined terrorist or a determined uh, non-state actor in an armed conflict. Of course, that does not mean, and please don't misunderstand me, that I'm saying don't prosecute those people. Of course you do that with all you have, but you cannot rely on such prosecutions to be successful. Still, you have to do it. And there are others who say, oh, we must uh, have incentives for those non-state actors. Uh, reward them with reconciliation and amnesty procedures after the fact. Sorry. After the end of a conflict, this may be a good idea in order to reestablish peace and security in your respective country. But this will certainly not help preventing non-state actors from deliberately violating the law. Rather, to the contrary. They will say, oh, if we do it in a most brutal way, the reward will even be higher at the end of the day. So I, have, I don't think very high of such proposals. Of course, except, uh, except it is the reconciliation process that some states think necessary in order to reestablish uh, um, uh, orderly conditions after the armed conflict. But that is certainly not helping during the armed conflict. And that is something we have to be aware of. So at the end of the day, um, I must uh, admit that asymmetric warfare poses a clear challenge to the, not only the law of armed conflict, but to many aspects of the international legal order. It does, however, not justify a deviation from well-established rules and principles of the law of armed conflict, to be quite clear on that. If we hold high our values, we should not devi deviate from those values by recourse to considerations of military necessity. And uh, if we are not able to uh, make non-state actors abide by the law, the only uh, uh, thing that remains is to be as clear as possible with regard to an observance of the respective applicable law. And finally, I must say, this, apart from all these considerations, uh, our gov respective governments, despite the fact that, we, that asymmetric warfare poses a challenge, are under a clear obligation to provide armed forces, security forces, with all that is necessary in order to make them or put them in a position to successfully fulfill their mission. And that is not only equipping them with the right weapons, it's also equipping them with legal clarity. And very often that is not done. And look, for example, at counterterrorism operations where especially many European governments say, oh, this is all self-defense, now you go. But what does that mean in the concrete circumstances of each single case? that you have a legal basis of self-defense. Can you kill somebody? What do you do if Osama bin Laden walks by and says hello? And all these questions have remained un unanswered, and that is something we have to do. We have to at least identify criteria and standards if we solely rely on the right of self-defense when it comes to military operations. I don't um, say we have to change the law. I don't say we need a new treaty or anything else, but just specify 
that law by agreeing on criteria and standards that would be most helpful and even the human rights community would be rather satisfied if that legal clarity were added to military operations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, a tour de force in 20 minutes, quite amazing. Uh, Andrew. Thanks. Can I have the slides, please? In fact, while they're just getting those on, obviously with uh, Wolf's challenge there on the football, I'm quite confident of an English victory on Sunday. Um, while they're just getting the, uh, the slides on, uh, the, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to, um, hopefully within 20 minutes, otherwise that stick does look pretty sharp, um, illustrate three UK cases um, and the purpose is very much one of illustration to develop the themes of the, uh, how legal scrutiny is affecting the UK, some of the themes emerging from those cases and the challenges that they pose to us. Um, and I'll, I'm, there's no intention and no time to go through the particular legal issues that have been developed in some of the case law that arise out of those incidents. Um, Excellent. There we go. Good. Um, and the back slide, please. Um, so with that, we'll go straight on. So that's the, uh, the scope of what we're intending to cover. So very quickly go into the first case, um, the Bahamusa case. Um, the, uh, the facts of this, 14th of September 2003, British forces in Basra, um, Iraq, carrying a, a pretty standard search uh, looking for former loyalists uh, of the regime, uh, carried out a search of a number of hotels, one of which um, a number of weapons, fake ID cards, and other suspicious materials found. Ten hotel workers, <laughs> including Baha Musa, were detained for questioning. Um, and over the next 40, 48 hours, when these individuals were taken to UK detention facilities, um, that there is no doubt that uh, most, if not all of them, were subject to abuse, physical abuse. Um, and in fact, the detainees evidence themselves, and it was pretty much continuous throughout the 48 hours. Um, involving quite a significant level of violence, um, including some suggested for the purpose of conditioning prior to questioning. Most importantly is the, was uh, 36 hours after tension was the death of Baha Musa on the 15th of September. Uh, a post-mortem showed that he'd received uh, 93 injuries, which are all uh, consistent with a systematic beating. So, Though that's the simple facts of that case. I say simple, uh, a simple summary of the facts. How then has that then been subject to legal scrutiny? Uh, and this is a very much a summary. Um, it is a, a, a chronology, if you like, and uh, uh, apologies for missing out some of, the, some of the details. But 17th of September, so two days afterwards, immediate investigation by the Special Investigations Branch of the Royal Military Police. Um, over a year later, um, Baha Musa, along with five other uh, separate cases, were joined into a line of cases that you'll be very familiar with, the Al Skaney cases. Um, and they were seeking principally that, um, for the, against the government's decision not to hold a, a full and independent inquiry into the incident, so through a judicial uh, review mechanism. Proceedings were, were, were launched in December of 2004. Um, and uh, sorry, prior to that in July, December 04, the UK uh, High Court ruled that the Baha Musa's death, as opposed to the other five cases, did fall within the ECHR jurisdiction, and that the investigations into his death were deemed to be inadequate for the purposes of Article 2 procedural obligations. And we'll come on to this theme again a full investigation, full and effective investigation. So, therefore, you had that line of, uh, of case law proceeding. But concurrently with that was in February 05 was an internal inquiry launched by the Chief or General Staff into this case and a number of others relating to allegations of abuse in Iraq in 2003 and 2004. Again, concurrently with this were the military justice proceedings following on from the investigation originally. Um, seven soldiers were charged in relation to the death and abuse, including the commander, commanding officer of the unit then, Colonel Mendonca. He was charged with uh, negligently performing his duties. The Court of Appeal upheld the original High Court decision in uh, December 05, remitting the decision on the investigation back to the Divisional Court. That was appealed by the Ministry of Defence. September 06, the court martial commences. 
uh, apart from a Corporal Payne, all pleaded not guilty to the charges. Corporal Payne, interestingly, pleaded guilty to uh, the inhumane treatment of, uh, of Baha Musa, which was the first uh, conviction under the International Criminal Court Act, the legislation that implemented the Rome Statute. So a war crime, uh, the first one under that act certainly was, was uh, committed by a guilty plea. In March 07, the six-month trial concluded. All but one defendant, and that being the guilty plea, uh, were cleared. Nobody was convicted of the direct killing of Baha Musa, as there was no evidence or no sufficient, insufficient evidence to prove who inflicted the fatal injuries. And Payne, in fact, only received a one-year jail sentence and dismissed from the army. The civil case against Baha Musa started, 07. June 07, the House of Lords upheld the Court of Appeal decision. January 08, so this is some nearly just under three years from the start of the internal inquiry that was published, that found while there was certainly uh, reasons and serious flaws in the way soldiers were trained, uh, no systematic evidence of abuse was found. March 08, the MOD admits substantial breaches of the ECHR over the death and abuse and agreed to pay some three million pounds in compensation resulting to the deaths. Throughout this, this period, a considerable amount of parliamentary scrutiny, but one particular uh, hearing in July 08, and um, we'll bring on this of military witnesses, was a, uh, a clear conclusion by the House Lords Joint Committee on Human Rights that they were concerned that there was discrepancies in evidence given them to by mod civil servant witnesses and uh, military witnesses to them in the committees in relation to evidence that later came out during the court martials. And in July 2009, a full public inquiry was launched uh, to deal with important questions raised throughout that litigation and the court martials that required answers. Importantly, investigating the circumstances in, into the death and in particular where responsibility lay for proving the practice of conditioning prior to questioning. And for those who are not aware of a public inquiry, but it's very much one of a, a truth-finding exercise, not one to attribute criminal or civil liability. And as you heard from Ashley yesterday, Al Scaney in that line of cases, Strasbourg, uh, started to hear those in June of this year. Al Swedi, second case takes you back to the May of 2004. On the one hand, you have allegations that uh, in a firefight that took place between British forces and insurgents in uh, the 15th, 14th and 15th of May near Basra, that uh, as a result of that, a number of uh, in suspected insurgents were detained, allegations that a number of them were murdered in detention and that uh, 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 five were abused. The Ministry of Defence has consistently maintained that it's clear from the evidence that there was in fact no murders or abuse, and the incident was, was one of a high intensity uh, uh, contact, 100 to 150 local militia ambushing troops. There were a number of dead insurgents. 20 bodies were taken back for the purposes of identification of those bodies to see if they could be linked to previous incidences. Nine were detained, but they certainly weren't abused, is the mod position. Al Swedi was one of those who died in the firefight. Allegation arose from those that were detained that they were um, abused while in detention. Those allegations made to the ICRC. Uh, so very shortly afterwards, a Royal Military Police investigation was launched. Um, in two, that start, uh, took place between 2004 and 2005. And whilst there was evidence they found of rough handling, that was consistent, they said, in commensurate with soldiers trying to extract themselves and detainees from a battle while still under fire. October 07, judicial review proceedings uh, started against the MOD for their failure to carry out an adequate and independent investigation to the allegations of murder and uh, abuse. 2007-08, in light of some of the evidence came out of those uh, litigation, a new, uh, uh, a fresh investigation was opened, so effectively a reopening, and that again concluded there was no ed evidence to substantiate the allegations of murder and mistreatment. April 2009, judicial review proceedings opened and they were due to last 15 days. It, it's fair to say that the Ministry of Defence um, had considerable procedural difficulties during those hearings, uh, in particular in relation to disclosure. 
Um, they repeatedly uh, gave assurances to the courts that disclosure had been properly effective, and then in light of further discovery, for, uh, produced further information to the court, to the point that in July 2009, the Secretary of State gave a statement in, in light of discovery of yet further emails and documents, it's clear that the searches to date cannot be said to have been effective and can non no longer be regarded as reasonable and proportionate. Consequently, we cannot provide the court with the reassurance it seeks that all material documents have been disclosed. The court, in a pretty forceful uh, judgment, uh, regarded the proceedings a complete waste of time at vast expense, and the Secretary of State was ordered to pay costs. July 2009, Secretary of State indicated that he intended to hold a ECHAR compliant investigation and made a public apology for the court, to the court for the failure to disclose the documents. The Metropolitan Police refused to take on the investigation on behalf of the MOD, um, and therefore, a result of that, um, the MOD um, announced that it was intention to uh, indicate it would have another pu a public inquiry along the Baja Musa lines. And it's worth mentioning at this point, we, we Ashley, Ashley mentioned, I think, or someone else did yesterday in the panel, the public interest immunity certificates. One of the issues that came out here was the court lambasting the MOD for what it said had transpired that it relied on partly false public information immunity certificate and that it was clear that a significant proportion of the redacted material, so that was being held, was in fact in the public domain already. First direct, the direction hearings for that public inquiry commenced in, in uh, June of this year. Lastly, the Smith case. Private Jason Smith, uh, one of our own British forces, uh, deployed to Iraq in June 2003. After a period of acclimatization, he, he moved on to Basra. Temperatures, for, of course, for anyone who's been out in that part of the world, were extremely high, over 50 degrees C, and that was the only measurement because the thermometers didn't go above that. 9th of August, reported sick, complaining that he was having difficulties coping with the heat. 13th of August, 2003, he was found lying face down in his accommodation, taken to a, by ambulance to a medical facility on the UK base, where he subsequently had a cardiac arrest, arrest and died. Now, the proceedings from that different clearly because it's one of our own in this case, and not one in conflict, but certainly in an operational environment, produced a different line of, uh, of inquiry. Firstly, you had the standard Royal Military Police investigation, and that supported a board of inquiry proceedings, which I'm sure you have your own domestic equivalents. So administrative internal proceedings to get to the truth uh, of what happened with the intent to make recommendations to avoid re recurrence. Two reports were considered, the first being slightly fell short of answering the full question, so a second report was conducted, and that completed in August 2004. Moving very swiftly on, the, uh, this went, <laughs> otherwise the, the stick's coming. The report pointed out that um, uh, litigation started, the family of Smith said that this was an in, in, effectively an inadequate proceedings. Um, the inquest was quashed and consensually another inquest with a fresh coroner was agreed. Two key points came out of the litigation though that they carried on despite this agreement. Firstly, related to the extraterritorial application of the ECHR, and that's the one I'll focus on. The court effectively said that the, uh, in the, for the purposes of the ECHR, uh, British members of the British forces remained within the jurisdictions whilst deployed on operations at all times. There is also issues to do with the procedure obligations for inquest, which I won't go into. Where does this take in then as far as those themes? Well, the first one, these three cases illustrate the complexity variety of legal scrutiny that the UK certainly will face. The volume of cases at the moment is considerable. The UK faces over 100 cases of judicial review in relation to a cases in Iraq. It's an unprecedented amount of legal challenge and scrutiny, mostly in re relation to the application of ECHR extraterritorially. Some are made on well-founded allegations, the Bahamusa being one. The others, such as the Al-Swedi, the UK position has been that there is no evidence to substantiate any of the allegations of murder. However, we've still ended up with a full public inquiry. The resources that we'll take to respond to this are not inconsiderate. While we're not looking at the Bloody Sunday inquiry, which you'll be aware of, which cost uh, 
lasted 12 years at the cost of £191 million. The public inquiries and judicial reviews are expensive and time consuming in terms of finance, specialist manpower and oversight at a high level. The investigation into the uh, Baha Musa by the service police was the, uh, and court martial was the most expensive in British military history, over £20 million. The disclosure issues that are coming out of this litigation are immense. In Al Swedi, there was 300 boxes of, K, uh, boxes in, of box files in relation to that, yet we failed on our ability to disclose sufficient information in relation to it. The sheer volume and technical difficulties of requiring to find the, 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 the material are considerable. Investigations alone, as Al Skaney, uh, the court said in the appeal, hampered by a number of difficulties security, interpretation, cultural difficulties, bodies buried within 48, 24 hours, sorry, lack of pathologists, facilities, all these are difficult and recognised, yet we are being challenged on our capability and independence grounds. Exposure of our people as witnesses. Now clearly we're all as members of the military, you do wrong, you expect to be a witness in a court martial. However, the volume of these legal proceedings is considerable and there are for example, 348 MOD witnesses in the Baha Musa inquiry. None of those necessarily, some of them, most of them, are not alleged of anything civil or criminally wrong. And they are witnesses, and it's an extremely stressful and distracting process they go through. There are also personal implications, even though some of them are not necessarily blamed for doing anything particular. In one case, one of the witnesses put up by the MOD to explain the purpose of the, the process of an investigation in a public ju judgment was said that he lacked the objectivity, proficiency and reliability and that in his evidence in any future proceedings should be treated with the greatest caution. And that is a professional uh, uh, policeman in the military. That is now on public record. That has a personal effect on that person. The operational risks and reputational, reputational risks are considerable. You've heard from Ashley yesterday about the detention operations and issues that flow from that. And I'll try and conclude quite quickly, Rob. Um, the Smith case, though, even on, I'll highlight on one particular issue on that. The MOD has said that if that the, the Court of Appeal and House, uh, the House of Lords uphold that decision and the, court, the House of Lords, sorry, Supreme Court uphold that when they heard the case in June, it will affect, have a disproportionate effect on military decision making in the field. They think or suggest that it will result in suboptimal decisions taken on the grounds and potential for soldiers to refuse command orders on the ground that it would violate their Article 2 rights. Reputational results as well. It, there have been significant in terms of uh, conduct of proceedings, equipment deficiencies, um, and abuses in the actual conduct of forces in, the, in, in operations. So you've had the reputational risks that have come out, of the, the court proceedings have been considerable. The PII certificate alone, the court said in relation to the, the conduct of the MOD in that case now, Sweaty, that it, unless they, until they take steps to correct the way they go about PII, the courts should in future treat the, the content of any such certificates from the MOD with considerable caution damning indictment on a Department of State. In relation to reputations for operations and the, and the public perceptions, the Minister has said that uncertainty created by unproven allegations risks undermining unfairly the reputation achievements in the armed forces. And if a serious allegation is not properly handled, the Army's position will be eroded and that would be very dangerous. Lastly, in conclusion, how do you bring this, what's our response been to all this considerable amount of challenging? Well, the first one in direct response to this volume of litigation and other procedural uh, scrutiny has been to create a new body. Even in this times of resource difficulties, a new directorate, two star, has, has been created, the Director of Judicial Engagement Policy. Aims greater coherence in the responses. I've been, wow, that is sharp, isn't it? Um, <laughs> in response to the, to the litigation, the planning of mi mitigation strategy, the cross-cutting issues, the manning of the, uh, uh, and, and use of your best and talented pool to respond to them, taking on the historical allegations by creating a new historical allegations team, again teamed by your best available resources, bringing in civilian expertise and dedicated counsel, dealing with allegations in a timely manner, 
The investigation's capacity and capability itself is also being uh, improved. Uh, and, and also efforts are made to reinforce the independence of the Royal Military Police, some in structural terms, perhaps others in uh, uh, statutory terms. So, advice to personnel, two more points, Rob. Um, in the Smith trace, extraordinary from that, that the commanders had to be reassured, and I'll read it, reassure commanders at all levels that this judgment in Smith does not alter their authority to make operational decisions, nor does it leave them open to personal legal challenge. Any claims brought on the Human Rights Act are brought against the department, not operational, not individuals. But there are operational risks, as we've seen by witnesses appearing in court, even though they're not being personally blamed. And so there is increased transparency and support, legal and otherwise, for witnesses appearing in court martial, uh, sorry, appearing in any court proceedings as a result of their duties. Where does this take us? That as a result of these operational and reputational risks, there is a need for an operational capability to respond to this because it does undermine the reputation. And without that cap capability that's well resourced, you undermine operations. Uh, and that hopefully, in a couple of minutes over, I apologise. Um, uh, and I'm happy to take questions on later. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. That was uh, another tour de force. Roy. Good morning, everyone. It is really a, a great pleasure and, and an honor to be here uh, with you today uh, together uh, with this distinguished panel. Uh, of course, the topic of this panel is very broad, and I, uh, for my part, would like to share with you uh, some of my thoughts in relation to Israel's investigations into allegations regarding the recent uh, Gaza operation. As, as you all know, as Nina discussed uh, yesterday, between December 2008 and January 2009, Israel was involved in Operation Cast Lead. It's a military operation in the Gaza Strip, specifically targeting the Hamas organization, who had been firing rockets at civilian population centers in Israel for years. Following the operation, Israel had to deal with an unprecedented wave of allegations direct directed against the actions of its forces. Israel has been checking and investigating all allegations. Today, after completing many of the investigations, it has become apparent that a significant number of the allegations were part of a strategy of lawfare by the Hamas, the objective of which has been to present Israel as a lawless uh, state. This strategy, of course, is appealing to non-state actors, as there, is as there is also asymmetry between the way in which democratic states and non-state actors treat and are affected by such allegations. And here I, I really want to associate my, uh, myself and my comments with uh, the things that Wolf has said. First, if we look at the asymmetries, uh, we can identify two uh, important ones. In the case of uh, democratic and law-abiding states, once allegations are made, often within minutes of the incident and before the facts are known, the reputation of the state is immediately compromised and it faces international condemnation. In the case of rogue non-state actors, however, there is little to lose in terms of reputation. Violations of the, laws of the law of armed conflict are anyway part and parcel of the behavior and the reputation of such non-state actors. Secondly, Demo democratic states take such allegations seriously and measures are taken by the law enforcement authorities of those states to look into the allegations. Non-state actors, on the other hand, have no incentive to similarly investigate such claims and nobody really expects them to do so. In fact, when we look at the uh, Gaza operation, I'm really not aware <coughs> of a single uh, a criminal or, or specific investigation uh, that was taken by the Palestinian side in relation to the firing of the 12,000 rockets at civilian population centers in Israel. And here I think you know, we, we come to identify one, uh, one of, I think, the most important problems today for international humanitarian law and international law in general, and this is the question, what, what do we do about, uh, uh, about non-state actors, about compliance of non-state actors? How do we encourage non-state actors to comply with the laws of war how do we encourage non-state actors to, to investigate and uh, take action consistent with the laws of war? 
This is really not the main topic I wanted to, uh, to discuss. The focus of what I wanted to share with you today uh, was what we were doing in Israel uh, in response to some of these uh, allegations. Uh, it may be worthwhile saying, you know, to begin with, that as an essential part of the identity of, uh, of Israel as a, as a democratic and law-abiding state, Israel has a firm commitment to comply with the law of armed conflict. An essential aspect of this commitment is the multi-layered system that we have in Israel for, investi for investigating allegations of violations of the laws of armed conflict. I, I will not go into a very detailed description here of our system just because I do want to get into some of the specific investigations, but uh, those of you that are, that are, that are interested in uh, learning more about si our system can find a, a very detailed account of what we do in two reports that we have issued, one in July 2009 and the other in January 2010, that are available on the website of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs that, uh, that describe in great detail the, um, the Israeli system of uh, investigation of allegations uh, of the laws of armed conflict. I will say just very briefly that we have a, a multi-tiered mixed military civilian system for enforcement of the laws of armed conflict. First, the military justice system uh, that has principally three components. One is the military police investigating unit, which does the investigations. Uh, the other is the military advocate general, who is independent from the IDF chain of command and is in charge both of the military prosecution and of providing a professional guidance to the military police. And then we have the military courts, which include the lower military courts or the district courts, as they are called, and the military court of appeals. All of these components of the military system have guarantees for independence and professionalism. Then there is the uh, civil, uh, or on top of that system, we have the civil attorney general, who has authority to review the decisions of the military advocate general, and then the Supreme Court of Israel that has the jurisdiction to review in the first instance both the decisions of the military advocate general and uh, of the attorney general, and which can also sit as a criminal court of appeals on judgment of the military court of appeals in, speci in uh, special cases. As you probably know, the Israeli Supreme Court adopted very lenient rules of standing and uh, making the court, in fact, accessible to any person or organization. The court does not hesitate to review any action of the government, including operational military decisions, and applies the laws of armed conflict, uh, conflict as the yardstick for its assessment of such decisions. I believe it is fair to say that the Israeli Supreme Court is recognized worldwide for its jurisprudence in these areas. The military advocate general is the focal point in the system for deciding whether criminal investigations are necessary. In some instances, the military advocate general will refer a case immediately to a criminal investigation merely on the basis of the complaint received. In other instances, after having reviewed the military field investigation, the military advocate general will decide whether there are grounds for opening a criminal investigation. In the aftermath of the Gaza operation, the military authorities collected all the information that existed in relation to alleged breaches of the laws of war and mapped it out. This included, and here I think it's important to stress that this was an active, it was not just waiting uh, to get uh, various complaints from organizations, <coughs> but it, it was actually an active effort to collect all allegations and, uh, and find all, all information that exists uh, that would warrant a uh, a certain type of investigation. And this included reviewing incidents re reported by IDF commanders and soldiers, uh, reviewing complaints filed directly to the military advocate general or to the attorney general, reviewing incidents that were reported in reports by NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, or some of the Israeli NGOs like B'Tselem, Physicians for Human Rights, and Adala, uh, reviewing incidents that were reported in the media, and reviewing incidents that were reported in other sources like the High Commissioner for, uh, by the High Commissioner of Human Rights or by the fact-finding mission of the Arab League or in the Goldstone Report. E essentially anything that was out there, we were uh, trying to get the information so that we can assess whether it warrants or justifies an investigation. 
The IDF authority examined every incident that was reported, whether it was reported directly or indirectly, and on a rolling basis identified nearly as many as 150 cases in which investigation was considered necessary. Out of these approximately 150 cases, the military advocate general ordered criminal investigations into nearly 50 cases. It is important to note that the vast majority of the cases mentioned in the Goldstone Report were already under investigation before the Goldstone Report came to light. It was only the few cases that in the Goldstone Report that uh, the government was not aware of uh, that uh, were then referred, were, that were following the report referred to, uh, to investigation. Once an uh, allegation is received, uh, all the relevant information is collected, including relevant intelligence information, military records and operational logs, and then the relevant soldiers are, of course, interviewed. Here I would note that you know, I think it's, it's worthwhile noting that the relying on classified intelligence information in investigations has its own problems, uh, because on, on the one hand, san such information is regularly not used as evidence in criminal proceedings in the event of an indictment. On the other hand, in the case of a decision to close the case, the information cannot be used publicly to substantiate such, uh, such a decision. Another important aspect of a criminal investigation is, of course, analyzing the scene of the alleged crime. With regard to allegations of violations of, laws, of the laws of armed conflict, this is, of course, very problematic, since by the time investigation is carried out, there is usually no evidence left to, uh, of the military use that might have been made with regard to the area, while on the other hand, the damage made to the target and its surrounding is still evident. This is one of the problems with the Goldstone Report, or for that matter, with the post-conflict uh, investigation, with any post-conflict investigation, which of course found evidence of damage and destruction to what appeared to be civilian infrastructure, while naturally at the time of inspection, finding no trace of the military use of such infrastructure. Some reports, for example, the EU report uh, on the Russia-Georgia conflict, at least recognized the difficulty. Since the scene of the crime is controlled by the, the adversary, it is also open to manipulation as part of the lawfare effort. One possible example of this relates to the allegations regarding the El Bader flour mill. The Goldstone report alleged that the mill was deliberately targeted by the IDF in a series of airstrikes on 9 January 2009, that it's it, it was argued that its destruction had no military justification and that the precise targeting of crucial machinery suggests that the intention was to disable the factory's productive capacity in order to deny sus uh, sustenance to the civilian population, amounting to the commission of a war crime. The military advocate general reviewed the materials as well as the findings of the IDF's investigation and determined that the flour mill had been struck by a tank shell. He did not find any evidence that the mill had been attacked from, an, from the air using precision weapons. He concluded that under the specific circumstances of combat and given the location of the mill, the mill was apparently hit during exchange of fire by ground forces. Following the publication of the military advocate general's findings, a newspaper article reported that the United Nations Mines Action Team had located an, unex an unexploded ordinance, ordinance uh, in the mill allegedly uh, used by the Israeli Air Force uh, contradicting the military advocate general's conclusion. On the basis of further, further analysis of the data and expert review of the new material showed conclusively that the, the Israeli Air Force knew of every aerial strike in the mill's vicinity throughout the operation and that the mill had not been attacked from the air using precise munitions that the shell found at the location had not exploded and hence was unlikely to have caused the fire in the structure. Aerial photos of the structure, clearly sh including photos by Human Rights Watch, clearly showed that since the structure's roof remained intact and the ex exterior of the mill uh, remained also intact, the damage caused could not be attributed to blast impact caused by an airborne shell. All the above findings led the Israeli Air Force to conclude that the appearance of the unexploded ordinance in the mill could not be explained and that it may have, may have been planted there intentionally. Now, an essential part of any investigation is, of course, interviewing the victims and potential witnesses. Here, of course, there is, pra uh, there, there is a practical problem. 
because the victims and some of the witnesses are residents of the Gaza Strip. And here, let me speak about three uh, specific issues. The first one is how and where does one interview uh, Gaza residents? And here the uh, IDF uh, went a long way to come up with a procedure that would enable the residents of the Gaza Strip to come to the Erez crossing, uh, which is the border uh, crossing between Israel and, uh, and Gaza. Uh, and there at a, a secured location provide, uh, provide testimony. Another measure that was taken was to create a procedure together with uh, non-governmental organizations that would actually have the access to the, NG to the uh, witnesses and would coordinate their, uh, would co coordinate their appearance in, in that uh, facility. Under that system, more than 100 Palestinian witnesses uh, or complainants were, uh, were already interviewed by the, uh, by the uh, IDF. Another issue is the, uh, that, makes, uh, that, that can cause difficulties is the fear of uh, reprisals of some of the witnesses uh, by Hamas. This is, of course, a problem that could lead witnesses to refrain from providing any information that could be detrimental to the positions of the Hamas. For example, it would require some courage, I would say, from a resident of the Gaza Strip to admit that Hamas was firing from a civilian area next to wh where this person was uh, located. Interestingly, the Goldstone Report mentions at the outset of the report that interviews of Palestinian witnesses were held in the presence of Hamas officials, and note that this might be problematic. However, throughout the report, they do not assign any weight uh, to this crucial factor and take all such uh, statements at, fa at face value. The third point that maybe needs to be made is that witnesses will sometimes be reluctant to cooperate with the Israeli authorities. Uh, in order to overcome some of these uh, concerns, Israel made significant and successful efforts to, uh, to alleviate these concerns by involving NGOs and lawyers that participate in the interviews of the witnesses. For example, in late March 2009, uh, we received a complaint alleging that IDF soldiers in the course of military operations during the operations in Gaza had enlisted the use of a Palestinian miner to search through bags believed to be booby-trapped. The MAG referred the complaint directly to the military uh, police that opened an investigation. Uh, they, there was a significant effort. It was not clear who the child was. A significant effort was made to actually uh, identify uh, the child and together with some of it with uh, an NGO, uh, Defense for Children International, uh, the military police was able to identify the child. Uh, the child, the complainant, together with his mother and his attorney, uh, came to the Ares crossing where the complainant provided his statement in the presence of his mother. The investigation revealed substantial evidence which led to a decision by the military prosecution to criminally pros prosecute two, soldier for their f two soldiers for their failure to comply with IDF instructions which prohibit any use of civilians for military operations. The trial has already begun in the t district military court with the prosecution having presented its case. Notwithstanding these efforts, there are cases in which the complainant refused to provide testimony to the Israeli authorities. For example, Mr. Abu Ida testified before the Goldstone Committee regarding alleged mistreatment by IDF soldiers in the course of the operation. However, when the IDF attempted to initiate a criminal investigation into the matter, he refused to cooperate with Israeli authorities despite numerous attempts to meet with him and ongoing co correspondence with his attorney. As a, re as a result, the military advocate general had no option but to close the case. Many of the investigations of the allegations uh, have already been completed, though some investigations are still ongoing. The length of time required to address allegations in a serious manner is another weakness of the system in an organized state used as a tool in law for. The allegation is out there immediately. The response takes months. By the time, it is, uh, by the, time uh, the response is published, no one is really interested in the facts, while the image left in public opinion is only one of the allegation itself. There is tremendous pressure on states to issue immediate answers which may compromise investigations. If they do make preliminary statements based on information known available at the time and later have to correct such statements in accordance with later findings of their own investigations, these are manipulated to portray the state as acting in bad faith.
For the general public, the public, there is a sense that prosecutions and convictions are the only indication that matters have been properly investigated. However, in reality, there is much broader spectrum of possibilities. F firstly, not every operational error is criminal. Secondly, allegations are not always evidence. Hearsay for, instance, is not, hearsay, for instance, is not generally admissible in our courts of law. There are, however, other ways of addressing indications uh, of operational failures which do not necessarily lead to criminal prosecution. Changes to doctrine, better training, better planning, but these are not usually perceived by the general public as satisfactory. Of the cases that have been completed, I will briefly discuss here three examples where the investigation has been completed. In two of the cases, the allegations were found to be baseless. The third may lead to a, to a, to a serious indictment. I want to speak a little bit about the case of Abu Askar. For example, the aerial strike against the house of Abu Askar family in Gaza was cited in the Goldstone report as an example of an attack on civilian objects. Whereas in fact, following the IDF's investigation into the matter, it was established that the cellar and other parts of the house were used to store weapons and ammunition, something which the Goldstone in inquiry appears to have neglected in its inquiry. And it's, it's quite fascinating to actually look at the testimony of Mr. Abu Askar that is available online to the Goldstone Commission and to see that he's not asked. He's not asked during the entire, his entire testimony as to whether he had uh, ammunition in his, uh, in his house and, and with respect to his relationship with the Hamas. Uh, Another example, for example, uh, another example that m might be of interest is the case of the Nam Namar wells. In this case, the Goldstone report described an airstrike on December 27, 2008, in which a water pump, uh, water pump wells operated by the Gaza, Gaza Coastal Municipality's water utility were struck, also killing an operator of the wells. As, and this was described as the willful and wanton destruction of one of Gaza's best sources of clean water and the unlawful killing of a civilian. They found no grounds to suggest that there was an, any military advantage to be had by hitting the wells and noted that there was no suggestion that Palestinian armed groups had used the wells for any purpose. After the IDF established the position of the wells with coordinates provided by the, uh, by this, by the Palestinian Authority, it was clear that this was facility was part of a, of, of a compound serving as Hamas Regional Command and Control Center and used for military training and weapons storage. All of this is, of course, can, can be shown through uh, uh, aerial photos of, of the area and, and other evidence. The military advocate general found that the IDF did not know of the existence of the water wells within the Hamas military compound. One can see that the wells are actually, uh, they, they exist within, an, in, uh, within a structure in that compound under a roof, so they could not be identified uh, and did not direct the strike against the water facilities. This is notable since the quick conclusion drawn by the Goldstone report in this regard also served as the basis of the allegation that the operation was part of a campaign intended to, publish, uh, to punish the civilian uh, population by depriving it of water and food. Let me just mention another, uh, these were two examples where actually the investigation found that there was no uh, basis to the allegation. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, just this one last case and, and two uh, concluding remarks. Uh, there is a case that has now been reported in the Israeli uh, press uh, w where there are allegations, uh, allegations were made that during the course of the operation, a group of civilians near Gaza City carrying white flags were fired upon from an area where IDF forces held a, a, a position. Investig at least according to what has, uh, this, this has been a, a very complex in investigation, uh, at least to under, it has been uh, uh, reported that the military advocate general is, is presently considering a, a relatively serious uh, indictment uh, of, of an Israeli soldier in connection with, uh, with, the, sh with the shooting uh, of, uh, of some members of this uh, uh, group. There is no decision yet by the military advocate general is holding a hearing uh, to decide the, uh, w which specific uh, count, uh, on which specific count to indict, but this is an example where, of, of course, the military advocate uh, general would, does not hesitate to, uh, to prosecute in a case where uh, there is evidence to substantiate uh, um, uh, prosecution, uh, even a very serious prosecution. Uh, in conclusion, I, I want to make two uh, points. 
aspect of uh, asymmetric warfare are evident in lawfare. One side has no problem manipulating facts and exaggerating. The other side is a responsible government that in order to repru repudiate the allegation needs to, pr uh, to pursue investigations that even, if done, that even when done properly take time and thus cannot respond to the allegations immediately. The result is that the media and the public opinion re receive a one-sided account without a persuasive response. By the time there is response, the damage has already been done. In the face of a lawfare campaign, the Israeli system is thor thoroughly investigating all allegations raised. While the system may not be perfect, it is a professional system which includes checks and balances, such as supervision by, a civi by the civilian attorney general and the courts. As the examples I describe here show, the Israeli system pursues the investigations in, in good faith and takes measures to prosecute soldiers when violations are pro proven. Ironically, much focus has been given to creating standards or for scrutinizing the Israeli uh, investigations for while, uh, while little attention has been paid to the often loose standards practiced by some international fact-finding commissions and reports of other organizations. Thank you. Roy, thank you. That certainly brings into stark relief some very uh, clear examples of the challenges that are faced, uh, which is the topic of this panel uh, today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take our coffee break. Could I ask you to uh, limit it to 10 minutes? I would like to start again at uh, 1000 on the dot uh, so that we can push through and make sure we've got sufficient time for questions and discussion. Thank you. <laughs>